Thank you for being here this morning, and we have come. You know, I was thinking, uh, uh, Bert just told me that uh, this is our eighth lesson in the book of Revelation, the eighth one. And all the preceding seven have been dealing, as you know, if you've been here, with uh, introductory matters to the book of Revelation. And I thought, he told me this was eight. Wouldn't have been neat if this was seven? <laughs> A complete introduction. So if it's eight, what would eight mean in figurative language? If seven is complete, what is eight? Really complete. Instead of six, 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 like seven, seven, seven. Eight. Well, whatever. <laughs> this is, Lord willing, the last uh, section of our introduction, and like uh, good introductions, like good classes, we take an exam, don't we? <laughs> When's the last time you did that? Well, that's a good question. That's a good question. Taking one or giving one? Either one. Oh, I, I give them all the time in the school <laughs> preaching, but... It's been a while since I've taken yeah, one. It's been a long time since I've been. But you, but you know, the older we get, the more um, uh, the more understanding we should be as far as the benefits of those things. You know, of tests. Christianity is a test and getting us prepared. And so does this introductory material. So I want to spend this class period. Oh, and by the way. What are you reminded me this morning? Look what I have. Do you know what these are? Any of you have been asking for these? It's coming, but I can't hand them out at the beginning of this class because I know what you'll do. You won't take this test that we're going to take, and you'll be looking at the notes. You'll be looking at the notes. For those of you that haven't been in the class, these are... Uh, your teacher's understanding of what the symbols are in the book of Revelation. So when you begin, and Lord willing, we will start with Revelation chapter 1 next week. In your preparation for that chapter, as you read it this week, you can have these. And you won't need it as much in Revelation, the first three chapters. You won't need this as much. But especially when you get to chapter 4, you will need... Um, or perhaps you can use this guide to the symbols in the book of Revelation, and you're going to see how easy this book is. It's just going to open up everything when you can plug in uh, what these symbols mean. But anyway, let me ask you a few questions in our test this morning as review, and then next week we are going to hit the ground running with Revelation chapter 1. All right. Question number one. Who wrote the book of Revelation? Who wrote the book of Revelation? God. Oh, right. God, the Holy Spirit, is the author of the book of Revelation. Who penned the book of Revelation? John did. All right. There you are, two for two. Doing well. Keep it up. Question number three. Is there an S on the end of the last book of the New Testament? No. You guys are kidding. Three for three. All right. From where did John write the Revelation? The Isle of Patmos, four for four. Where is the Isle of Patmos located? 70 miles south. 70 miles southwest of Ephesus. Ephesus. Oh, you guys are good. Why was John on the Isle of Patmos? He was exiled. He was exiled. Now, you may not believe this. This will be this will be one of those tests, one of the questions on the test. Now, if you ever went to a state school, and if you ever took uh, uh, 
uh, science classes or something to do with origins, you know you have to give what the teacher wants and then you can write down why you don't believe what the teacher And this next question may be this, I don't know, we haven't got into it uh, in, in a very deep way yet, but we will. Who put John on the Isle of Patmos? Who exiled him there? The Roman Empire. Well, everything that I've heard so far sounds pretty good. I've heard it from about seven of you. Uh, but the Roman Empire did. We believe it was uh, during the reign of Domitian. Uh, some of you will probably take an earlier view of the uh, reign of Domitian. Uh, I take a later view, but that's okay. If we can get it within the reign of Domitian, we're doing well. We're doing real well. Domitian put him there. Uh, let, let me ask you, uh, what was that, question five? Here's question 5B. Why was, um, why did Nero not put John on Patmos? Because he didn't do that. Yeah, he just killed him. He didn't do things like that. He didn't exile prisoners. He just, he just killed them. So that leads us to our next question. Um, what kind of literature is primarily implemented in the writing of the Revelation? Figurative. What do we mean by figurative? Coded. Okay. Analogies are used in figurative language. Symbolic language. Symbolic language. And question eight. Why did why did uh, John write in symbolic or figurative language? Why did he use that? Language that we're just not used to, and it's so hard to understand. Why do so you do that? So the Roman government wouldn't know what he was saying. Yeah. You know, John was probably fortunate that he was just exiled. If this got out, what he was writing, um, it might be worse than that. And so he wrote in code. Guys, when you were younger and you were in your boy clubs, <laughs> Didn't you write in code about how ugly the girls were? <laughs> you remember though, you remember all that code, right? And did you remember uh, you had a secret handshake and a secret this and a secret that? Well, John had to do a lot of this in secret as he was in exile in order to convey the message to a certain group and to keep it from another group. All right, very good. What is the theme of the book of Revelation? You see, a good introduction, a good study of the book, a good study of any subject, a good study of any book, will study from the general to the specific. That's how you get an eighth grade student to understand algebra. You don't start in the middle of the book as he gets his book. That's why I didn't want to give you this all at once, you know, the symbol. I didn't want you to look and be on oh, these symbols. Oh, how am I going to do this? No, 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 no. No, no, no. Every math class should start out. One plus one equals what? And then you go from the general, then to your specific study. And just like Genesis is the book of origins, Revelation is the book of consummation. What is the purpose of the book of Revelation? What is it to, what did it tell? First of all, let's keep it in its context. What did it specifically tell? And what questions does it specifically answer that the first century uh, church, our brothers and sisters, actually, really, what questions did they have? What did this book answer for them? What was their question, first of all? How long? That's the question of the book of Revelation. How long? How long what? We suffer. How long are we going to go through this suffering? Lord, sounds a lot like what his people were asking way back in Egyptian bondage in Genesis, right? When he sent Moses, he heard the how long questions. Do we have similar questions today? Lord, how long? How long are you going to put up? with what we're putting up with here. 
No matter if it's from a physical standpoint, a governmental standpoint, a national standpoint, or whatever, a sin standpoint, Lord, how long? That's what the book of Revelation is all about. What was specifically the how long referring to in the first century here? We say persecution. Do we really grasp that? What kind of persecution? Death. Death. And worse. And worse. Absolutely. You've heard about a fate worse than death? It was bad. But you know, a lot of the apostles, really all of the apostles, suffered deaths like that. You remember a few weeks ago in one of the, one of the lessons in worship, we talked about, um, we talked about the mother of James and John wanting her boys on either side of the Lord in his kingdom. And Jesus asked them a question. Do you remember what that question was? <clears throat> Yeah, are you ready to be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to endure? He wasn't talking about Great Commission baptism, not our baptism. He was talking about the baptism of suffering. He was talking about his crucifixion, and he said, okay, you want to be, you want to be right here in the kingdom? You want to be up front? Then you better be ready to be crucified. And so he tells us, if we're not willing to pick up the cross daily, and the cross that we pick up are not, you know, just the normal frustrations of life that we bring about because we've emphasized the things of this world more than the things of God. We're, we're talking about real suffering for the cause of righteousness. And I wonder how much of that we really grasp. But this is the context of the book of Revelation. You know, this, this kind of. And so it's asking, they're asking the question, how long? And um, question nine, what was the answer to that question? Oh, this is an important question. This is, I need to know the answer to this question because this kind of implies my whole outlook on the book. What was the answer to the how long question? Lord, how long is this persecution going to suffer? What was the answer? Be patient. All right, be patient. What else? As far as timing goes. Shortly come to pass. Shortly come to pass. Thank you, Ed. I hope that if you have received anything in the first seven complete lessons to this introduction we have seen clearly that the events of this book generally speaking especially in verses uh, chapters 4 through 19 are going to be fulfilled in that time we're going to see next week and we're not going to let this get any less emphasized. These things are not only being signified, signified, they are going to happen shortly. So because they were fulfilled in the first century, does that mean there's no application for us today? No. No. You know, other than second coming passages in the New Testament, the rest of it has been fulfilled, right? Think about it. And so it is with the book of Revelation. There is a blessing that is given to those who read and understand and apply this book. And for no other reason, just given that idea, faithful members of the body of Christ should want to know and believe that they can understand the book of Revelation. Very interesting paradox about this book. 
probably the book that people are most interested in and probably the book that is less studied. You would think those things would go hand in hand, right? Something you're very interested in, you study. Not so seemingly with the book of Revelation. Some come to the book already putting up a metal block. There's no way that I can understand it. And it's amazing how easy this book really is. About when was the book written, would you say? 96. 96 at the latest. Maybe around 83 at the earliest. But hopefully uh, you won't come to a conclusion that it was much earlier than that. What are some different approaches to the book of Revelation? We mentioned uh, five or six uh, over the course of the introduction. Give me the name of one of the book of Revelation that people take. Preterist. Preterist. Good. Preterist. What does preterist mean? Most times, English words have their definition in the word itself. What prefix do you hear of that word? Pre. What does pre mean? Before. 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 Those that take the preterist position, preterist position. <laughs> I'm speaking in signs. The preterist position believe that the events have already taken place before. Extreme preterists think that they've taken place before the end of the first century, namely around the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Don't believe that. I do not believe that. I am not an extreme preterist. But I am a moderate pre preterist. Is it okay to be moderate? All right. In that, the events of this book primarily have been fulfilled at the end of the first century, beginning of the second century, in this specific Domitian persecution. And Domitian reigned for a while, right? From about 81 to 98. That's pretty long for, for a Roman uh, emperor. Uh, so the preterist position. There are some facets of all of these approaches to the book of Revelation that we can believe. And that's why I like to say that my position is more eclectic. It's a, it's, it's a type where we take bits and pieces from each of these approaches. The preterist position, the part that we take from that, is the fact that it was written beforehand. We believe literally what Revelation says about the time of its fulfillment. These things must shortly come to pass. Oh, please, burn that into your minds as we study this book. It's important. All right, preterist. What's another approach to the book of Revelation? Futuristic. Okay, you didn't go in order here. You went from <laughs> one pole to the other pole. All right, the futuristic method. Uh, we can probably all ascertain what uh, that means, that primarily, generally speaking, the fulfillment of the book of Revelation is yet in future events, and there are many things that go hand in hand with the futuristic approach to the book of Re Revelation. Number one, primarily, you would not believe that even the kingdom is here. That the Lord came to establish the kingdom the first time, but since the Jews rejected him, he failed in that mission. And instead of setting up the kingdom that was prophesied, by the way, by Daniel in the days of the Roman Empire, right? We all know Nebuchadnezzar's dream and what all that entailed. Nevertheless, in the minds of the futurists, the kingdom is yet future, and the Lord is going to establish a physical kingdom. He's actually going to bodily mount a literal white horse in the land of Megiddo in Israel. And he's going to actually sit on David's throne. And we saw many clear passages of scripture where the Bible says that the Lord will not do that. Will not do that. 
do that in clear black and white statements. And statements that say that there were those listening to Jesus that would not die till they saw the kingdom come with power. The futuristic method to the book of Revelation. There's probably fewer parts of it that we can put uh, or take from in order to uh, establish our eclectic method. But there's one that we can. At the end of the book of Revelation, it is talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. So just those few passages at the end, we can take and say, yes, that is yet future. But I've tried to find more from this futuristic method to able to build our eclectic method, and I can't find much. In fact, that method, generally speaking, contradicts more passages of Scripture than any other doctrine that I know of. Other than, perhaps, a literal physical indwelling of the Holy Spirit that's telling me things apart from the Word of God. Maybe that one. All right. The preterist approach and the futuristic approach. What were some other ones that we mentioned? Now we're getting into those that really took notes. Continuous historical. Continuous historical. Good. There are some that believe that the book of Revelation is like a figurative depiction of history from the time that John wrote until Jesus comes again. Therefore, you can get events like World War II and Hitler and Mussolini and, uh, and, and so many other historical figures, and they can all somehow have a spiritual uh, uh, beginning in the book of Revelation because some view Revelation as a continuous historical. That's not right. And I know that was popular in, in the Lord's Church early, earlier on. We're getting more and more away from that, for which I'm very grateful. But the book of Revelation does not talk about that. For many reasons, the number one being what in the world would Hitler have to do with the first century church and all that mess. No, not at all. Not at all. Continuous historical. All right, what's another approach? The philosophical approach. Good. That says that basically all of the book of Revelation is just a general discussion of the battle between good and evil. There's no really specific applications to the first century or applications of general details to our day and time. It's just kind of a mysterious, philosophical, you know, kind of approach. Those four approaches are the main approaches. But what I'd really love for us to do is take the right points out of all of those and come up with our eclectic. That way, you don't have to be so concerned about all the detailed, you know, the, the extreme preterists, the moderate preterists, you know. Let's just cut to the chase, shall we? And just uh, look at the book of Revelation, really, as the Holy Spirit intended 21st century Christians uh, to look at. All right. What else? What else do we need to make sure that we understand as we open the book of Revelation? Do you believe with all of your heart that you can understand this book? Knock down those barriers that you've always had about this book. I'm telling you, Satan does well, doesn't he? He is a, uh, a formidable foe. He knows how to knock the pillars out. He knows that he can't answer arguments specifically, so he has to create in our minds, well, you know, is there really a God? Is there really truth? Is there really, you know, can you really understand the Bible? Can you really understand Revelation? You know, if God is not the author of confusion, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And if Revelation is part of the inspired canon, that only leaves us with one conclusion. If I put forth an effort, if I utilize just a little muscle in the shovel, 
that I can get this book. I can understand this book. And I hope that in this introduction we have seen that the conclusion of the book, how long? To those folks in the first century, it was these things must shortly come to pass. We say how long in light of the theme and the purpose of the book of Revelation. We conclude, be faithful unto death and we'll receive the crown of life. And that's what Paul said, right? When he left this earth. He says, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me on that day, but not to me only, but to all of those. That's us. That's us. You know what that tells me? Paul hasn't received his crown yet. He said it would be given to me on that day when we all receive that crown. Our first century brethren were dying. They were seeing their relatives slaughtered. They didn't know what else to do but to cry how long. It's interesting as we sit here in our 21st century air-conditioned padded pew building. Maybe to really get this. Maybe there's something good about suffering. Are you suffering now? Do you know the blurb on the radar screen in your total existence, how significant that is? It's significant if it determines your destiny. But as we say and ask how long, like our first century brethren, realize that there is something more important than our existence here. <coughs> there is a fate worse than death, worse than physical death, and that's spiritual death. That's not being faithful through our how long questions. Oh no, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing ignoble about asking how long. But you know your answer, right? Shortly. Whether it's the coming of the Lord, which we don't know is going to be soon or not, but we do know that we're not going to be here a long time. And so where is your mind today? You can't serve God in money. It's an impossibility. You can't serve God and the physical things. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. And when we have been in eternity, you can't even say a long time, right? You can't equate, equate eternity with time. There's no such thing there. But whatever that comparison is to time, if the Lord allows us to even look back and say and, and think about time here on earth, you know what the scriptures teach about that? This is just about, this is a light affliction compared to the eternal weight of glory. And so the book of Revelation is all in this context. He's telling the people, no matter how intently you are suffering, oh, you don't know. The human language can't totally express what is just on the horizon. The Lord created us. He knows how we think. He knows what's enjoyable for both the body and the spirit. And he said the spirit world does not compare to what you're going through there. Hang on. Prove your faith to me for just a little while. And keep faithful to death. You know, there might be a person in this room that's thinking about cutting out. Most of you are on the backside of life. Wouldn't it be a shame to lose it now? You're this close. You're this close to finishing. Don't quit now. It doesn't matter the, the physical burden. It doesn't matter. Just keep on keeping on. The Lord endured it all for us. 
And he taught us what it means to endure through how long. All right. The book of Revelation has a great message. And the final message is this. You win. If you stay faithful, you win. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to think, what's the use? You're going to think all these things. The book of Revelation says, just stay faithful and you'll win. It's like when we talked about the fellowship book. Was that last Sunday? Sunday before? I don't even remember. The Lord tells us that when we get on his fellowship, his book, the ship will not sink. And the church will not sink. The only thing we have to be sure of is that we keep ourselves on the boat, that we keep ourselves faithful, that we don't go AWOL, absent without leave. Can't be absent in his service. Stay faithful. That's the resounding theme of the book of Revelation. A second theme is this. Jesus is ruling in the kingdoms of men. Remember what Daniel prophesied about the kingdom that would be established in the days of the Roman Empire? That's the first century. That's early first century. That's like uh, 8030 on the day of Pentecost. What do you say about that kingdom? That's the fellowship. That's the ship. It's not going away. It will last forever. The kingdoms of this earth break into pieces all the time. And the kingdom of Christ takes some residual effect of these kingdoms breaking in pieces. Well, what happens when kingdoms break in pieces? People get distraught. They look for something. Why did the church grow so much in the first century? Being persecuted and they were scattering, right? And they were converting the fragments from these different nations. That's what our job is. The secondary job you have is however you make money. And that's no big deal. Your primary job is kingdom business on this fellowship that will not sing, that will not go away. And even in the light, even in the fundamental idea of persecution, we still fight the good fight of faith, right? Christianity is a fight. Some people are in it as observers on the sidelines. They come to worship and they sit and they look. And that's about it. Monday through Thursday, it's back to the old grind. What's your old grind? What's your old grind? Well, we're grinding in this battle. Paul said, I have fought a good fight and I have finished the faith. Fighting equates faithfulness. Not fighting equates no faithfulness. It's really that simple. And Revelation is telling us how to endure. It is a book teaching us how is a good soldier of Jesus Christ to endure? That's what Paul told Timothy to do, right? Be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I don't know when the next time we will sing Soldiers of Christ Arise in our worship assembly. What goes through your mind when you sing that? Are you getting yourself ready for tomorrow's battle and bringing somebody to Christ? Or are you thinking about your hectic schedule that keeps you from doing that? What are you a soldier in? The book of Revelation comes alive to those who are suffering for righteousness' sake. Do you have to put up with those inside and outside of the church that really aren't as spiritual as they need to be? How long, O oh Lord? How long? The question resonates to us today. All right. What other comments or questions? This is your chance now before we get into the crux of the matter. What comments or questions do you have as far as the general scope, the general outlook, 
the theme, the context of the book of Revelation. Yes, sir. Can you <coughs> describe what fighting is a little bit more in detail? Okay, yeah, that, and that has a direct correlation to the book of Revelation. The question is, can we describe this fighting in a little more detail, this battle, this, this Christian fight? Yes. How many times does the Bible tell us that it's not a physical battle? And see, that's another problem with the futuristic approach. If you are a futurist as it pertains to the book of Revelation, you think that there is going to be a literal fight. But the Lord said, in fact, it was prophesied in the Old Testament that there is a peaceful nature to the kingdom. You know where the lion will lay down with the lamb? When do you think that's going to happen? What does that mean? Peace in the church. That's peace in the church. That's the peaceful nature of the kingdom. It's not a physical battle. And so the next time you, you hear Elvis Presley singing, There'll be peace in the valley. And hopefully you won't hear that song sung in the Lord's church. That's exactly what that song is talking about. That there's going to be a futuristic peace in the valley where the lion will lay down with the lamb and everything's going to be hunky-dory and, and, and no sin. And after the cleansing comes and after this battle, there's going to be peace on this earth. The question is, is apt for our consideration. No physical battle. Jesus was before Pilate, before he was to be crucified, you recall. And he made a very significant statement. The same, and, 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 and people today are making that same mistake, wanting a materialistic military kingdom and fight. Jesus said, say it with me, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. Fight. That's not the fight we're talking about. What fight are we talking about? Our fight is with the mind, Paul says. Right? It's a spiritual battle. It's, a, it's an argumentative, which doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. It's an argumentative idea, discussions with principalities and powers concerning this earth, but it's not a physical battle at all. John? Yeah, part of that battle, and one of the most important bases, is the struggle and battle within ourselves, putting ourselves aside, submitting to putting Christ's uh, purpose first, uh, carrying his, taking ourselves outside of our comfort zone to carry this, <coughs> battle to those around us. That's right. Uh, and that that's the hardest struggle for us in a lot of ways, especially in today's comfort standards. Uh, and see, those kinds of considerations should be made before we decided to enlist in the army of God. And we've decided to put, that's what repenting is all about, putting the worldly philosophy behind, never going AWOL, you know, not many soldiers that, that enlist expect to go AWOL in the first few years they're in the Army or the Navy or whatever, right? But making those decisions beforehand, realizing that we're in a real fight, but as far as this is concerned, it shouldn't be a physical fight. And John's point is well taken. No, that fight doesn't have to be worse because of, you know, internal struggles. Those things are constantly rearing up, too, within us. It's a, it's a continuous battle. Right. That's right. Good. So this fight, guy, is not a physical battle. It's not a physical one where we take up arms. It's a spiritual battle. And by the way, that is, as we'll see later, that is the battle of Armageddon. You're fighting it now. That's what that is. Not a battle later. Good. What other questions or comments? We've got about four minutes. On the discussion of whether or not we can understand the book, should give credence to it, obviously. Um, is it 2 Timothy 3.16? It mm -hmm. starts out saying all scripture. It doesn't say all scripture besides Revelation. <laughs> you know, 
Very good. Very good. Either that has to be the opinion of some, or they don't believe Revelation and Scripture, one of the two, and both of them are false. Good point. What else? You better get your ticket punched if it is a physical battle, because there's only going to be standing room only in the Valley of Megiddo. That's a good point. Have we made that in the last eight weeks? The Valley of Megiddo, you know how big it is? For a worldwide epic battle to be taking place there, there's going to have to be more than one miracle wrought. Absolutely. Very small, very small portion of land for a battle. The Battle of Armageddon. Next time you hear that, you may hear that on TV sometime today. You know the context of that, and you're going to hear these fantastic stories. Listen, the futuristic approach to the book of Revelation does not lack for fantastic stories. For sure. Why is it in religion that we have we feel like we have to embellish the Word of God to make it attractive to people? We shouldn't have to do we should have to do that in our worship services. We shouldn't have to do that philosophically as a general approach to the Word of God. You know, parents, do you like your kids involved in drama? I don't mean drama from a play standpoint. I'm talking about drama stuff at home. You don't like drama, right? You want them to deal with truth, don't you? The God of heaven is no different with his children. He's not interested in our dramatic productions. He's not interested in all the drama. He's interested in truth. And that's what we need to decide as we enlist in this army and fight this battle of Armageddon, that we are going to hold the banner of truth. No matter what the consequences may be. Are people making fun of you for that? I hope so. If your faith has not been tested, it is not true. If your faith has not been castigated, it's not from God. Why did the Lord tell the apostles, hey, you're going to suffer? He tells us, don't think it's strange, you know, if, if you're suffering persecution. But we think it's strange if we, if we do this. We can do this. We can overcome. All right, I heard a first bell. You've got about two minutes to ask any question before we go. And once we go, we're going. We're not going to lag back because this book has been half taught already. You don't know that yet, but when we get to the end, you're going to see that this book repeats itself in cycles. There's not a whole lot to it as far as a lot of new material. It's the same stuff being repeated, and you're going to think, we studied 22 chapters, and that was it? All my life I thought this was a, a difficult, terrible book, and that's it? When the light finally comes on, folks, it's going to be a eureka moment for sure. Yes, sir. I can tell you, Rick and Pam and Loretta can tell you that the valley where Megiddo is. Tell us. They were just there. It's not a big place. <laughs> Well, somehow it's going to have to get big if the futuristic approach to the book. There's a whole right. lot of people going to have to fit in. That's right. That's right. Was there any, when you saw it, was there anything, you know, any uh, anything written around it or anything talked about where it's kind of referring to this big battle that's supposed to be there? Do you remember anything no. like that? No. no. There was well, you take some of our televangelists over there and let them have a devotional there. Well, you'll get the full, full word of that, for sure. Okay, good. What else? Handouts. Handouts! Thank you. <laughs> wow, could you imagine us going through that? I mean, that boy, I'm dead, dead, dead. All right, Woody, come on. A couple guys, can you help me pass these out? Um, I don't know what short we're going to have. We'll see. We'll see. All right, let's start out with one per family first, and we'll make sure that everybody gets a copy. 
um, if we can do that, 